Good morning. Welcome to the Appomattox Project Dialogue. I'm Karen Hale, co-chair along with Charlie Cannon of the Appomattox Project, an effort that is hosted by Utah Valley University's Center for the Study of Ethics. Appomattox Courthouse, the site where the Civil War ended, has become a symbol of reconciliation and civil discourse. The Appomattox Project is a multi-year effort designed to focus on the ethical dimensions of civic discourse, public policy, and democratic society. The project includes a variety of events and activities, including workshops, public lectures, student research, panel discussions, and community partnerships. Today's dialogue, entitled Partisanship and the Public Good, will explore American political culture and the need to strengthen our fragile public square. The Appomattox Project is pleased to host two political leaders known for their commitment to bridge building and to civic dialogue, former Governor Gary Herbert and former Congressman Ben McAdams. Gary Herbert served as our 17th governor in the state of Utah. He was born and raised in Utah County where he would eventually serve as county commissioner for 14 years. Uh, as governor, he was uh, chair of the National Gover Governors Association and uh, the Western Governors Association, and he also served as president of the Council of State Governments. And as governor, Mr. Herbert uh, fostered economic growth, building Utah's economy as the strongest and the most diverse in the nation. Former Governor Herbert is involved with the UNITE project, and we hope to hear more about that later, Governor Herbert. Uh, UNITE is a national impact initiative that is animated by a new way of seeing each other and the work of building America's future. So we look forward to hearing more about that. Uh, former Congressman Ben McAdams is currently a senior fellow at the Sorensen Impact Center at the David Eccles School of Business. And he founded an organization, the Common Ground Institute, to focus on bridge building and problem solving on matters of public interest. And we look forward to hearing more about that today as well. McAdams is a seventh generation Utah raised in a family of eight, and that's where he learned hard work, honesty, and duty to the community. Um, as a middle child, that's also where he first began to de develop his skills as a mediator and consensus builder. He further honed those skills as a Utah State Senator, Mayor, and member of the United States Congress. In his public service, he brought Republicans and Democrats together to get things done, like addressing homelessness, forming public-private partnerships to improve education and health outcomes in our community, and promote evidence-based decision-making at all levels of government. And today we are pleased to have, as our moderator for this discussion, Astrid Tumanez, president of Utah Valley University. She was appointed, appointed as the seventh president of UVU in 2018. And prior to coming to UVU, President Tumanez was an executive at Microsoft, where she led corporate, external, and legal affairs in Southeast Asia. She also served as vice dean of research at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, National University of Singapore. She has worked in philanthropy and venture capital in New York City and is a permanent member of the Council on Foreign Relations. She is the author of Russian Nationalism Since 1856, Ideology and the Making of Foreign Policy, along with many other publications. Welcome to you all. And President Tumanez, I'll turn the time over to you now. Uh, thank you very much, Karen, for the very gracious introductions of myself and our guests uh, this morning. This is a very exciting uh, session, I think, and I wanna thank my colleagues from the Center for the Study of Ethics here at Utah Valley University for organizing this. I will make some very brief comments before we turn to Governor Herbert and Congressman uh, McAdams. Basically, the, we'll set up this morning as uh, a conversation, and then we will have time later to turn to our audience for any questions that they may have. So I wanna begin by thanking Governor Herbert and Congressman McAdams and say to them that in the words of Teddy Roosevelt, they are men in the arena. They are not just armchair critics. So they've been bruised and bloodied and they got things done. And again, in Teddy Roosevelt's uh, words, they are men who have dared uh, greatly. So thank you for being with us today. 
Uh, secondly, I want to read a quote from Abraham Lincoln. The year is 1861. This is from his first inauguration. And seven states had already seceded to form the Confederate States of America. Lincoln said, we are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic chords of memory, stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land, will yet swell the chorus of the nation when again touched, as surely they will be by the better angels of our nature. So let's all keep that quote in mind. And then just a last uh, preliminary comment for me, I'll talk about my personal experience. I grew up as a child of martial law in the Philippines, where it wasn't just hyper-partisanship, but only really one point of view. And uh, if you disagreed, there were very severe, violent consequences. And when I came to the United States as an 18-year-old immigrant, I was so impressed by this sudden feeling that I had of freedom, this inviolable freedom of the citizen to express different things and still be part of the community. And my sense, having lived in the former Soviet Union as well, is that no democracy can survive if there is purely contempt and hatred between parties when everything is a fight of all against all and when the world is seen as a battle between good and evil. And we are at a point in American politics, we have seen it in the last decade, perhaps this uh, evolution of hyper-partisanship. And so um, turning now to uh, Governor Herbert and Congressman Ben McAdams, the first question I will pose is, what does the phrase bonds of affection from that Lincoln quote mean to you in the current context of American politics. So uh, we'll start with you, Governor, if that's okay. Well, thank you, President Taminas. It's great to be with you. And I appreciate all those who've organized this opportunity for us to talk about a very significantly important aspect of politics and how we get along and interact with each other. And certainly I think uh, the, the problem we face with too often, and, and it's not just in modern history. I mean, I, I think back of the early days, uh, we had two members of Congress, I'm sure Congressman McAdams knows this story very well, uh, that started fighting. And uh, one came the other, uh, Brooks came to a guy named Sumner, almost to death. That was just a, a fight in the Congress. Uh, we had Aaron Burr, who was a sitting vice president, uh, gets in a duel with the former Secretary of Treasury, uh, Alexander Hamilton, and kills him. So we've had some, some disagreements, you know, along the way. And uh, I think too often, this is my own view here, after 30 years of being an elected official, that we view each other as us and them, not recognizing that we're on the same team. And we should be kind of warriors together in a great cause of American democracy and a representative government that we have today, all working for the same goal of trying to improve the lives of the people that we represent. And that's a challenge, you know, the ups and downs of the economy, the ups and downs of the issues of the day, the changing culture, the changing mores that we have in society makes that a difficult challenge. But again, uh, Congressman McAdams and myself, although members of different parties, we are on the same team, trying to serve the people that we represent as best that we can. That's what it means to me. Thank you, Governor. Uh, Congressman. I would agree with that. Uh, you know, in my experience, bonds of affection, I can relate to having served it in the state Senate, first of all, and then as mayor of Salt Lake County. In both of those cases, I was a Democrat uh, when we were 20% and the Republicans were 80%. And then when I was mayor of Salt Lake County, the, the, my council was five Republicans and four Democrats. So I always had to work with people from the other party if I wanted to get anything done. And I, I, I soon found that as, as Governor Herbert mentioned, you, you get in, you roll up your sleeves and you start working on these issues and you realize that those people who belong to a different political party, they're on the same team. They're serving in many cases because they love our state, they love our country, they wanna make it a better place. And we're serving for the same reasons. We may have different perspectives on 
the strategies for making our, our community better, but the commitment to our community is the same. And, um, and I think that's maybe what's been lost recently in our politics. So, you know, uh, Governor Herbert and I disagreed from time to time, but it felt like there was never a line that, there was a line that we were never willing to cross uh, of making it personal. I never attacked Governor Herbert's values, his integrity, uh, because I respected him and I knew him. I also knew that I would see him at dinner uh, eventually in the next week or so that I'd sit next to his wife at dinner. People, his wife is someone who I deeply respect. Governor Herbert is someone who I deeply respect. So there were always limits to what, to where I was willing to go with my disagreement. I kept it on the issues and never personal. And I would contrast that to DC. So um, one of the things that people point to as a, as a marked change in our, our politics in Washington in the 1990s, where uh, people stopped living in Washington, D.C. and started commuting. And I, I will say, I think as someone who, when I was in Congress, I, I, my family lived in Utah. I would uh, fly out on Monday morning and spend the week in D.C. and fly back home on Thursday night to be with my family. There are certainly benefits to being back home. I think one of the benefits is you get out of this D.C. bubble and you connect with people back home, real people, and you realize they're not they're not consumed with the same issues that politicians in DC are consumed with. So I think there's some benefits to that commuter um, lifestyle that's available because of modern transportation and technology. But there's some things that are lost, people say. When people, when everyone lived in DC, they, their, their kids went to school together. You were on the PTA with parents from the other party. You went to soccer games on the weekend and saw your colleague on the other side and, and you formed those bonds of affection that transcended just debate on, on a particular issue. And it seems like today, now that so many people, um, their engagement with each other in Washington is superficial. The only time they seem to engage is on a split screen on a cable news show rather than having those bonds of affection. And I think that um, has degraded the level of our discourse uh, around difficult issues. We're gonna have dif differences of opinion. We're gonna have difficult issues, but it feels like we need to have those bonds of affection to overcome those differences. So we can ultimately realize we are on the same team. We care about the same issues and we're all working to make uh, our community be a better place. Uh, thank you. So, so I think this idea that we, we are working for the same things, we are in the same boat, uh, coming back to Utah is sort of a reality check uh, in, your, in your journey, um, Congressman McAdams. But you also mentioned several times that we've lost something. So let's focus for a moment on what we've lost and maybe you know how terrible is the situation that we're dealing with. Um, Senator Ben Sass, I hope I've pronounced his last name correctly from Nebraska, wrote a book called Them. And in it, he said, uh, community is collapsing, anxiety is building, and we're distracting ourselves with artificial political hatreds. That can't endure, he says, and if it does, America won't. Alongside this book is another very interesting book by Robert Putnam and Shailene Romney Garrett. And in fact, this Appomattox project had Shailene Romney Garrett as a speaker just a little while ago. The book is called Upswing. You may have heard about it, but they track data since 1900, looking at economic inequality, political partisanship, social capital, and cultural narcissism. The I is more powerful than the we. And they argue that um, all of these lines, they've never been worse, you know, <laughs> since 1900. So could you both comment on how terrible is the situation that we find ourselves in today in terms of what we have lost? And uh, could you speak about a few practical uh, solutions? So speak first about how bad it is uh, today, and then what are some practical solutions that uh, might be proposed or that you may even be doing now yourselves? Uh, can we start with you, Congressman McAdams? Sure. Actually, uh, my I, friend Ben, because I've known Ben a long <laughs> time. <laughs> That's right. Uh, well, thank you. Um, ben is great. Uh, I, first of all, I, I do think it's bad today. And uh, uh, in my service in Congress over the last two years, it was really bad that, uh, you know, it gets to the, and, and from what I, I talked to my friends and colleagues on both sides of the aisle in Washington today, and they say that um, the unimaginable is that it's even worse in 2021 than it was in 2020. Um, you talked about the um, artificial 
political hatreds. Uh, and you know, I've read Ben Sass's book. He's, a, I think, a great leader in 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 working to bridge this divide and to bring us back together. But how many of us today, whether you're a, a member of Congress or uh, or just a coworker or uh, a member of a community, feel like you have nothing in common with somebody on the other side? It's us versus them. They are coming for us. The the left is doing this. The right is doing this. And we paint in in broad characteristics, the Republicans hate this or oppose this, the Democrats hate or oppose that. And, um, and in my experience, like our politics are as diverse as our, as individuals in this country that, um, and I always tried to refrain from, in, in my comments, from, from categorizing in broad brush, from saying the Republicans are opposed to this or the Republicans even support this because you're going to find people who support and oppose different things. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and oftentimes I think one of the challenges is we, our politics devolves to positions and how our positions are different. And we don't look at our values and how our values are oftentimes aligned. So just some practical solutions. I think one of the first and most practical solutions is um, to give each other the dignity of how holding positions that are respectable. Governor Herbert and I, I could list things that we disagreed on. I could list things that we agreed on. Um, but um, I, I would always, I will, I always try to dignify my opponents, our disagreements by understanding why we disagree that, that, and, and allowing them to have the dignity of, of having a position that is not nefarious, ill-motivated, corrupt, those are all words that that once once somebody is disagreeing with you because they're corrupt because they they don't care about the country they don't care about the community you don't you can't bridge build from that you know if one side is right and the other side is evil you can't really bridge build with somebody who's evil and wants to destroy us um, so it's first of all I think in our language and in our actions dignifying those who disagree with us and then working to bridge build around that so. Practical solutions, I, I would point to one of the things that I've done since I left Congress is I formed an organization called the Common Ground Institute. And this is built around my belief that uh, we, we often talk about the Utah way and how Utah is unique in our approaches to solving problems, how we can come together, uh, Republicans and Democrats, in spite of disagreement, to, to tackle some pretty tough issues. And we've got an impressive Utah resume of issues that we've tackled by coming together. And um, one of the things that I've observed has, has participating firsthand in some of those consensus building processes is um, it feels like those, we do a good job as part of our DNA is reaching out and building consensus, but each time it feels like we're, we're starting from scratch in the consensus building process. And I think we can actually learn some takeaways from that consensus building process, something that, and, and create an uh, ecosystem where we can replicate more quickly consensus building around tough issues. And that's what I hope to do with the Common Ground Institute. And I would point to maybe one starting point for how we do that in Utah and where we can more easily replicate it, just add water approach to consensus building. And that is, again, when we focus on our positions, there are going to be a lot of disagreements. When, um, when we talk about, um, we had a debate about addiction and treatment for addiction and crime and, and drug abuse, all of those things, the positions are, uh, you know, we need to address crime, we need to expand access to treatment. And we maybe had some differences there. But when we said, what is our value? Our values are, we want our streets safe. Nobody disagreed with wanting our streets safe. And our values were we wanted to give people, help people who were contributing to crime in our community to help them get back on their feet and be positive contributing members of society. When we sat back and said, okay, we all agree on those values. How do we get there? Then we were able to identify positions that were um, unanimous and, and Governor Herbert really led out, but there was work done by myself, by Lieutenant Governor Spencer Cox and Speaker Greg Hughes uh, to find consensus around a dealing with an addiction problem in our state. And um, the problem's not solved today, but we came up with some solutions uh, where we expanded access to treatment, where we um, made sure that people who were breaking the law and making our communities unsafe, there were consequences for bad actions, but where a door was closed, another door was open for people to turn their life around. And um, we took an issue where there was stark disagreement and we turned it into consensus that has made our community all, a little bit better. And 
I, I think that we can learn from that. What, what's happened in the past issues where we've had that disagreement and we've come to consensus and we can learn to replicate that at the state level. Um, and it's gonna be built around these bonds of affection, first of all, that I think already exist, but working to foster further bonds of affection and then um, creating an ecosystem where consensus can happen. It doesn't just happen magically, it has to be deliberate. Yeah, I, I think those are really great points and uh, allowing individuals who disagree with us the dignity to hold those positions, um, the common ground approach in terms of values. It reminds me of the Getting to Yes book by Roger Fisher and William Urey. You have to move beyond the positions to get these underlying values you do share. So, so I think those are all really amazing points. And I was just thinking we could apply them all to Utah Valley University when we have disagreements. Um, Governor, over to you. Well, thank you. I appreciate the comments of Congressman McAdams. And uh, I agree that we ought to focus more on the goals that we have, and that will unite us. Uh, the division comes in how we get there, the pathway we take maybe the role that government plays in our lives. And I'd be quick to, to add that I think in Utah State, our, our great community here, and uh, we do a little better job of this than others. Uh, we're not uh, as uncivil uh, as others. Uh, we don't have quite the negativity that we see in other states. And that's a tribute to the people, to the culture we have here of civility and mutual respect. and a willingness to tolerate and understand different opinions. And that's some of the things we're losing around the country and we need to be concerned about that. The cause of it's probably the issue at hand. Uh, why do we have this? Uh, most of us would sit down if we were given a quiz and, and here's the question, and here's the answer. We'd get the answers correct. We should be more civil, respectful to each other and we should work together in a spirit of collaboration, cooperation, if we're gonna achieve the appropriate outcomes for the people that we represent, which really are the bosses. Uh, we're the hirelings, they're the bosses, and we should represent those folks as best that we can. I think part of it is political ambition. You know, you talked about two of my great heroes, uh, Teddy Roosevelt and Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln was elected to one term of Congress, two years. He'd failed in a number of other elections, and then, gets elected as president of the United States at a very difficult time and becomes known as one of the great presidents of all time, if not the greatest. Mm -hmm. But just one term in Congress, that's unheard of. I don't know that it could happen today. Uh, so political ambition gets in the way. And sometimes when we run for office, thinking, boy, I'm going to do remarkably good things when I get into office, the end then justifies the means. I, I can't do any good if I don't get elected. So we have a tendency to, in fact, be a little more negative in our attacks on our opponent. And that political ambition sometimes gets in the way of doing the right thing. Um, uh, I think also uh, another uh, part of the problem is the public tolerance of that kind of an approach. Uh, you know, people use negative campaigning and negativity in their relationships because it works. Now, I think one of the most divisive things we have today in the, the public square is cable television, particularly the political channels. Uh, I know Republicans go to Fox News and Democrats go to MSNBC, but they bring on bomb throwers, uh, people that in fact try to generate some anxiety amongst the faithful followers, and it becomes more of an us and them. Why do they do it? Because it increases ratings. So the end justifies the means of what we're doing there in the public Always. In fact, we become siloed in our view of the world, and we our attitudes and biases are reinforced by who we listen to and talk to. So the public tolerance of this is something that we need to con concern ourselves with, too, and not just the personal ambition. I can tell you that when I was the chairman of the Western Governors Association, and particularly when I was chairman of the National Governors Association, because we were more equally divided, Republican governors versus Democrat governors, I recognized in my very first meeting, okay, we all got here because we ran on a party platform. Some of us are Republicans, some of us are Democrats. We had one independent at the time, and you, we have our own biases and belief systems that says, 
for the best, for the good of the people who represent, this is my platform. These are the things I stand for. This is what I will try to do if I'm elected. So I said, we all campaign on a partisan label. And that's tattooed right on our forehead. So people know Republican, Democrat. So I said, now that we're elected, and we have to get things done, let's take that label off of our forehead and replace it with common sense. We ought to all belong to the common sense party, which will help us get past some of the petty differences and actually concentrate on getting things done based on a common sense, practical approach. And frankly, that works. Uh, uh, some of the, the concerns we have as states and as governors was the micromanagement that we see coming out of Washington, D.C., the mandates would come from Washington telling us, the states and the local governments, by the way, what to do and how to do it. Now, as we talked about that at Republicans and Democrats, none of them were supportive of that, by the way. The Republicans would like to have more block granting of the money so we had flexibility to do what we want to do with the money. Democrats didn't like the term block grants, but they liked the term of flexibility. We're not that far apart. The Affordable Care Act. Uh, I talked with President Obama uh, many times about the Affordable Care Act, and he said, Gary, I know it can be modified and improved. And Republicans said, we want to repeal and replace. Repeal it and replace with what? You know, whatever that replacement could be, it probably would be a modified and improvement of the Affordable Care Act. If we had the right terms in place and proper leadership, we can bring people together and say, repeal and replace with a modified and improved Affordable Care Act. We could all be together on that and work in a bipartisan way. So, again, the challenge is for leadership, for us to, uh, to uh, for, forego some of what we think will get us success getting elected and do the right thing in the right way and have the public, in fact, support those people who bring to the table a, a civil approach with mutual respect for difference of opinion and are, are uniters and not dividers, which we see too much of today. So, so let's let's follow up a little bit about that because we need more uniters, it is true, rather than dividers. But we are in a place today where I think where the parties are in particular, the, de the Democratic and Republican parties, the homogeneity within the party, and this is shown by research, the homogeneity is so strong, stronger than it ever was before. There is a certain kind of litmus test of purity in both parties. Well, at the same time, the differences between the two parties as well are, are becoming bigger. And some um, commentators and scholars argue that you know, we need change from inside. So let me repeat that phrase, change from inside, change from within the parties themselves. Because I think both of you point to the common goals and, and it is true, we need to be in that pragmatic middle where we get things done, things that reflect our common values. Um, how can change from within the parties happen? Th that is one question I'd like to pose. And then uh, secondly, would you both please comment some more on the Utah way? I've, I lived here in 83 to 86 and I haven't lived here. I didn't li live here for a long time. I returned in uh, 2018 and I have my own sense of what the Utah way is, but if you could comment on that as well. So, how does change from within each party happen and talk about your respective parties? And how can we further explain and evolve the Utah way of doing things? Um, Governor, do you want to start this time? Change sure, let inside. me try and take a whack at it and then Ben can and solve all the problems that I, <laughs> I leave out. Um, you know, I, I think the system itself is partly to blame. Um, what I hear from people running for office and those who are incumbents is they don't want to be primary. It's hard to fight against members of your own party. And so uh, it's one thing that for, for a Republican to fight against a Democrat, there are obvious differences there. But for a Republican against a Republican, which we see too much of, uh, the fear of that at least, and that's because we end up having a purity test well, you're not as Republican as I am because of this issue. And we've kind of gotten away in the Republican side of the ledger from the leadership of Ronald Reagan, who did bring people together. He would go to lunch once a week with uh, the Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill. 
Uh, they worked together very closely on a number of issues, didn't agree on a lot of things, but agreed on many. In fact, it, uh, one of the great things of all time in politics was Ronald Reagan leading the charge on cutting taxes and got the Democrats, in fact, on board so that they had one of the largest tax cuts in American history. I think at the time we were like a 70% of an income tax rate. He brought it down to about 28% and led to a, a great uh, uh, you know, generation of prosperity. But they did that together. And Reagan's comments at the time were, one, we have a big tent and people are welcome inside the Republican Party. Uh, and he said, if you agree with me 80% of the time, you're my friend. Today, uh, too often in the Republican Party, uh, is if you uh, disagree on one out of 100 issues, we'll give you one. But if you go two, we want to get rid of you and replace you with somebody more pure. And so the purity test, I think, has become a problem for probably both parties, but I see it particularly in the Republican Party. And, and how are you going to get it, fix it? You need to have a Ronald Reagan uh, kind of rise up and say, there is a better way to do things. And you're welcome in our party, even if we don't agree on every single uh, tenant. Maybe it's a varying degrees of how we approach these things. And, and uh, also, you know, the, the, the dirty word in politics right now is compromise. And, uh, and yet, if we look back in history to the greatest document that most all of us would genuflect to, the United States Constitution, the greatest document ever created by man in the history of the world was uh, created because of compromise. Great minds had strong opinions, intelligent people that got together, but they compromised to come up with that document, uh, which we call the miracle of Philadelphia in 8, 1787. And so compromise should be at least a part of the vocabulary and not back uh, look, uh, looked at as if, if you compromise, you've sold out on your principles. I think that's a big mistake and a big problem. I've tried to, when I, uh, my own approach of what we need to add to the, to the conversation is, I'm, I'm not abashedly a right of center conservative. I make no bones about it. I, I, that's who, who I am. And based on that, I think that will give us the best outcomes. But I also, in declaring I'm right of center politically, I'm also moderate in tone and inclusive in process. And Ben uh, would be left of center maybe slightly. Uh, he certainly is moderate in tone. And I know in working with him, he's inclusive in process. Uh, we've done some remarkable things together that's helped to solve the problem. I'll just mention one last one and I'll let Ben sum it all up. Uh, we had a significant challenge here a few years ago, and it was across the country with uh, the rights, the civil rights of the gay community and the aspects there and religious freedom. And so, uh, again, it was it, it certainly was a, a controversial issue on both sides of the argument and across the country. It happened here in Utah. I brought in the different uh, parties that were involved. And I said, let me just give you a suggestion. If you bring me a bill on religious freedom only, if you bring me a bill on gay rights, civil rights only, I will veto those bills. But if you bring me a bill that encompasses both aspects of the civil rights of the gay community and the religious freedom aspects of the Second Amendment, if you'll put that in the same bill, I know we'll get to a compromise position and find common ground we can all support. And that's exactly what happened. That evolved to a common bill with both sides working and compromise and working together. We passed it, had a great celebration. We announced it uh, in, on the rotunda of the Capitol building. And I had calls for the next couple of months from other governors around this country saying, how did you do that in Utah? Because they know we're a very religious state. How did you do that? And I told them the process. We came together. We had good communication, good dialogue. We we're willing to compromise and find common ground. And we passed a very significant piece of legislation which serves us well today. Yes. And in fact, I think that does encapsulate in many ways, you know, uh, the phrase the Utah way, as well as uh, great politics, because politics at the end of the day is about the art of, of compromise. So thank you for bringing up that example, which I know was talked about not only in this country, but even abroad as a great way to, to find the middle ground. Um, Congressman McAdams. 
Thank you. I have a lot of thoughts on this. Um, first of all, when I was in law school, I had a, a law professor who had been an elected official, and I told him that I was interested perhaps in someday serving in public office. And he gave me advice that has stuck with me uh, for, for ever since then. He said, look, there are two types of public servants. You can be a thermometer. A thermometer is a tool that will tell you what the temperature is in the room, or you can be a thermostat. A thermostat will change the temperature in the room. And I think part of that they more thermostats and fewer thermometers. People who look around and say, I see people are really upset about this issue. So if I reflect back to them what they're feeling, that's going to be good for me politically. We have a lot of elected officials like that. We need more thermostats. And I think the example that Governor Herbert gave with LGBT non-discrimination and religious liberties is a good one. Incidentally, that is um, the issue um, that I first started working on. I was uh, a staffer for the mayor of Salt Lake City when Salt Lake City had proposed those protections at the city level. And I worked with the state Senate, with um, religious organizations, with LGBT organizations to forge a consensus around that city policy. And, uh, and when the city adopted it with support from various groups, it was, um, you know, it, it propelled me to then run for the state Senate to continue some of that bridge building work. And um, I would use that also as an example when Governor Herbert led that consensus building process to pass that, those protections on a statewide level, um, he was very inclusive in the process, but I think it's also worth noting that that process takes years. It didn't happen in just weeks or days, or, and it didn't happen magically. It was very deliberate, very inclusive, and it took a lot of time, and people were persistent and stayed with it. So going back to that thermostat, I wanted to give another example and a compliment to Governor Herbert. There was a period several years ago where there was some anti-immigrant fervor, and um, governors around the state were saying, we don't want refugees in our community. And Governor Herbert was, uh, I think, at, at political peril to himself, stood up and said, Utah, he was the only Republican governor to say Utah will continue to accept refugees. That one statement sent a ripple effect through the entire state of Utah and changed the minds of thousands of people and how Utah approaches immigration. And I would commend Governor Herbert for being a thermostat. He changed the temperature in the room in an instant by taking a position that the world then reoriented, our political world in Utah, reoriented on our axis around his bold statement in that regard. And I think that is something that should be commended. Um, I was speaking to um, the Weber County Democrats. They had their convention a few weeks ago and they asked me to speak on what Democrats can do to be um, more um, successful in Utah. And one of the comments that I gave to them is I said, look, when, when we elect Democratic officials, you need to recognize that they weren't elected to, be, to represent the Democratic Party. They were elected to represent a district. And in, in Utah in particular, if you're elected as a Democrat, it's because a lot of independents, you, you didn't get elected because half of your voters are Democrats. You got elected because independents and Republicans chose to vote for the Democrat. And I said to them, but if you want to be successful, you need to allow your Democratic elected officials to act independent of the party and to represent their district, not the party. And that's going to mean that they may vote against what the party wants. And, you know, I, um, from experience as a member of Congress, I was the most independent member of Congress, the one most likely to vote against my own party. And I think the parties themselves, as the governor, uh, Governor Herbert mentioned, stop it with the purity tests and allow our representative, we want our representatives to to be bipartisan and to work across the aisle. But then when it comes down to um, parties themselves, parties want their representatives to be pure. And we need to stop that. We need to allow our elected officials to vote their conscience, to vote um, what they hear from their district and reflect their district. And I think far too often we hear elected officials from both the Republican and Democratic side saying, well, you know, I, I kind of think this, but I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat. So I have to support my party nominee, even though they're, uh, going against things I believe in, I have to be loyal to the party. And I think that's garbage. I think we need to be, we need to have elected officials who are willing to be thermostats to, to go, uh, to change the temperature in the room. And that oftentimes is going to mean speaking against their own party. Um, that's not an easy thing. But I think that's when we come back to the Utah way, in conclusion, the Utah way is one where um, we look at ourselves as being part of Team Utah, not Team Republican Team Democrat, but Team Utah first. And um, I wanted to give one more example. When COVID hit, and we saw around the country how um, COVID brought out the best of us and it brought out the worst in us. 
And um, I, I want to talk about some of the some of what it brought out the best in us that happened in Utah with two examples. We saw, like around the country, how COVID was hitting really hard on minority communities. And Governor Herbert convened a commission from representatives from diverse communities to say, what are we going to do about this? It was not an us versus them. It was we recognize that if one of our communities is suffering, we all suffer. And if the virus spreads in one of our communities, it's going to spread to the rest of us. So it's not only our better angels, it's our self-interest to address those who are suffering the most among us. And Governor Herbert led out with that commission that had tangible, quantifiable results that undoubtedly saved lives and, uh, and brought our community to heal rather than divide in this pandemic. And we've seen politicians around the country from both sides use this pandemic to divide. And, um, and the good politicians are the ones who used it to unite. And the other example is, as people were suffer suffering economically, we all rolled up our sleeves and we had a, a, a task force of uh, our congressional delegation, our state of Utah, our business community. That it, and we were, it was a one-stop shop. If people reached out and said, I'm, I'm having a challenge here, we would all rally around that to help that individual business or family to get the resources they need. Sometimes they were state resources, sometimes they were federal, sometimes they were faith-based or private sector resources, but we didn't see it as who's gonna get credit, are Republicans gonna look good or Democrats gonna look good. We saw it as a Utah who was struggling and needed resources and we rallied in a unified way to respond to that. And I think those are a couple of examples of, of the Utah way, how we put the interest of our state and our community ahead of, of um, partisanship. Thank you. Um, I really like that idea of uh, leadership being a thermostat rather than a thermometer. I think that's in fact at the core of what true and effective leadership should be. And then, you know, let's, let's just take a moment to celebrate the Utah way further. Some months ago, I was reading about Professor Raj Chetty's study on the American dream. And you know that uh, Salt Lake City is ranked about the same as Denmark when the question is posed, what would be the probability of a person in the lowest quintile, the poorest, making it to the top quintile? And in an, an ideal world, it would be 20%. Salt Lake City is, I think, over 11%. And Denmark is the, is the best at 12%. And the four factors that were singled out um, is that Utah has strong social capital. Utah has a disciplined government, disciplined public sector. Utah has great universities, so hurrah, because I'm a university president. And that finally, Utah invests in community development. So um, I think it's, it's appropriate for us to celebrate the Utah way and acknowledge that there are many terrific examples of how that manifests itself. Um, I'm gonna start taking, so, go ahead, Governor. Well, let me just, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but let me just add a, a, a PS to that. Uh, Michael Bloomberg, former mayor of New York City, called me up and asked me to come and visit with him, wanting to know why we had the largest middle class, the most diverse economy, and what he called the American dream of upward mobility was best in Utah of any state in America. He knew that because Bloomberg News did an analysis of the 50 states mm -hmm. and said just what you got through saying uh, about the ability, if you're at the lowest rung on the ladder, to get to the highest rung on the ladder, it, it's about one in 10. It's really yeah. good odds for you to improve. I talked about the Utah way in the White House about six or seven years ago. And it came about because I was there visiting with the president, the vice president, we and, and four other governors. And, and Vice President Joe Biden came over to me and kind of grabbed me in his Joe Biden way by the shoulder and said, Gary, things are going so well in Utah. What is your secret? What is going so well? And uh, I said, well, it's the Utah way. And I talked about the practical aspects, the fact that we actually have dialogue and, and have discussions back and forth and try to find solutions. We are fiscally prudent. We don't spend more than we take in. We, don't ha we have reasonable debt, not irrational debt. And that, that empowers the private sector to create economic op opportunity and create wealth and create jobs. That really is the Utah way. And, and I, it's, it continues to this day going forward. We are in fact positioned the best state in America coming out of the pandemic. And we have the lowest unemployment rate and the highest job growth creation of any state in America today and the lowest mortality rate coming out of the pandemic. That is the Utah way, or an example of the Utah way giving us the right outcomes. 
I, um, I want to so add on that if I, go I ahead. can real quickly. One, one more addition I would say to the Utah way. Sometimes when Democrats hear me speaking about the Utah way, they groan and their eyes roll because they're, <laughs> and, and I think we need to acknowledge there, there are not everybody in the state agrees with every decision that's made in the state. And I would just say that's not, that's not what we mean by the Utah way. It doesn't mean that I support 110% everything Governor Herbert did. Although I do, Governor, support a lot of what you did. And, and you know that and we worked closely together. But um, it's not that we agree on everything or that we wouldn't do things that, that I may have done things differently than, than Governor Herbert did. But what I think it means is, first of all, as a Democrat, I was always at Governor Herbert's table. I was never told that I did not have a seat at the table because I'm a Democrat. Sometimes my suggestions weren't implemented because he disagreed, but he didn't disagree with me because I'm a Democrat. He disagreed with me just because he disagreed. So I think part, part of the Utah way is it's an inclusive process and we include people who disagree. And coming from the Democratic side, um, not that I um, support everything Governor Herbert did, but I don't let perfect be the enemy of good. That I realize that I was 20% of the legislature. My party comprised 20% of the legislature. I didn't expect that we were gonna get 100% our way. And if it wasn't 100%, then we would oppose it. The, the minority party, the Democratic party sits at that table and we contribute. And we say, look, if we can get some of, some of our values and some of our priorities reflected in an approach, then we're gonna be at that table and we're gonna participate constructively. And so I think that's where you see this constructive give and take between the Republicans and Democrats in Utah um, that isn't, neither side is expecting 100% or 0%, but it's a constructive disagreement. Not that, not that we have 100% agreement, but it's constructive disagreement. And that's the Utah way. And, and let me just add, Ben, uh, because of your attitude and those of many of your colleagues on the Democratic side of the aisle, as governor, I met with the Democrat leadership once a week. I had an open door policy to meet with them at any time they wanted to on any issue, because I know you're there to make constructive uh, suggestions of what can we do to come together and solve a problem. That's the attitude. And, and you're exactly right. That is the Utah way. And it it's is not it a is, Republican way. It is a Utah way for all people. Yes, it, it is also sound politics, by the way. And I think uh, when we talk about the concept of democracy, the tensions are real, the push and pull are real, but you know, you don't break the system by having a certain rigidity and brittleness and an exclusive approach. Uh, I'm gonna start taking questions from our live audience. And this first one is, is, is uh, I'm gonna put the governor on the spot. Uh, this is from one of our audience members. How can the GOP best respond to the charge that their party has accepted anti-democratic practices during the Trump era? Say that again, uh, to take uh, what kind of untried? How can the GOP, so the Republican Party, best respond to the charge that their party has accepted anti-democratic practices during the Trump era? So the premise is that you know, the, the Republican Party itself accepted certain practices that were not healthy for, for democracy. You, you, you don't have to accept the premise of the question, but uh, how would you respond yeah. to this? Well, again, we certainly had a unique situation under the Trump administration. And we have people that thought, fine, we've got the bull in the China shop. We want this going to break some glass that needs to be broken. Uh, again, I had a lot of my friends that ran in 2016, a number of governors, and we had 16 Republicans. And Donald Trump was not in my top 15. Uh, again, we it was a, a unique situation. And uh, I, I, again, I, I like some of the things that he did, but I certainly didn't like the, some of the ways he did it. Uh, we have always pretty well, uh, and both sides of the aisle, by the way, are guilty of this, of saying we want men and women of good character that have integrity and transparency to be our leaders, our elected officials. But we all have come short sometimes of the people you look back as some of the different presidents we've had on both sides of the aisle, how they've conducted themselves, their, their conduct not only as elected official, but in their private lives as well. Uh, members of Congress the same way. I'm sure governors, we have uh, one state that has a wing for governors who have been uh, uh, charged criminally and have been found guilty and have been have gone to prison. So uh, we have, uh, you know, characters that uh, 
have had not the kind of character we want to have for honesty and integrity. So again, I, I'm not going to comment on on the past administration of Trump and his foibles. Uh, I recognize that there are some, and, and in the communication aspect of what he did was contrary to what we're talking about here today. He was narcissistic. He was petty in many of the things that he would do and say. He got some good things done, but that doesn't overshadow the, the, the need for improvement in other areas, which is what we're talking about. Last but not least, I'll tell you that part of the problem we have is the system itself of elections. How do we elect people? And the elections themselves brings kind of the more strident, extreme voices to the forefront I actually have a proposal to solve that called rotating regional primaries. That's a discussion for another day. Um, thank you, Governor. Uh, Congressman McAdams, would you just comment on the broader issue of uh, democratic, the fragility maybe of American democracy? I, I have views on this, but I'm not the speaker today. Um, you know, because like I said, I lived in the Soviet Union and, and I lived under martial law and under a, a, an authoritarian regime in the Philippines. And I always thought that that American democracy was so robust. But um, what are your own thoughts on on where are the the, the fragilities of, of our democracy? Well, I think the power of our democracy is um, our founders created a system where we could resolve differences in ways other than violence. And and I would characterize it as my preferred way, which is we resolve differences by uh, identifying common interests and common values and working to find common approaches and common strategies to doing that. And it's an interest-based approach to problem solving. But there are two other approaches that are also nonviolent ways of addressing problem. We have um, a legal base. We have the courts and you can sue to uh, resolve a dispute um, or power-based. And, and what American democracy did is in, instigated power-based problem solving through elections rather than violence. Um, that, uh, that, and I remember when I was in the state Senate and I was complaining to the Senate president at the time that my bill wasn't getting heard and I was frustrated about that. And he said, I have some advice for you, win more elections. And uh, it was a stinging kind of criticism, but I think it's true. But the thing that worries me about the fragility of our, our democracy today is when the public from the far left to the far right start believing that they cannot have access to resolving disagreements through elections. And that then if, a, if an election is not a way to resolve a disagreement, then where else do they go? Then they start falling back into, into violent and vandalism. And we see that from the left to the right. And I think you know, starting with that, I think, is gerrymandering. When districts are drawn, that elections don't matter because Republican or Democratic Party has drawn boundaries, that the, the die is cast before an election even happens, people start, it starts to erode the confidence in an election. That, then you see very few congressional districts change party hands because they, the way the boundaries are drawn, there's a certainty that a certain party is going to control that. That erodes confidence in an election. But I think it, um, it did significant damage to the public's belief that they can resolve disagreement through an election um, when the president of the United States is casting uh, doubt on the legitimacy of an election, allegations, false allegations of voter fraud that, um, that are not held up. Um, that's where you see this people saying, I can't, I can't express my disagreement through activism and campaigning for my candidate and if I can't affect change through that, I'm going to have to find other means. I would encourage people that is not acceptable. Let's fix our democracy rather than abandon our democracy. But I think we've, we've seen a lot of harm done by the, the President Trump and people who enabled him, people who gave credence to his, um, his misinformation, his lies, um, have done damage to our democracy. And now it falls to all of us again to come back and repair. We have to instill trust in the public that First of all, that there's a process, let's come together and talk about our common goals and common interests. But if that doesn't work, let's um, fix the underpinnings of our democracy that you can, it, the, the option of last resort is to campaign hard for your candidate and get that person elected and that you can then make a difference through that. And, but we have to instill confidence and trust in that democratic system because harm has been done. Yeah, le legitimacy is a very powerful concept in political science, especially if you're gonna have peaceful transitions of power. And I'm gonna tie this in with a couple of questions that have come in from our audience. And our audience today represents many uh, age groups, many political persuasions, but two of these questions here 
have to do with the role of individuals. So the individuals must have this role and empowerment in democracy in order to sustain the legitimacy of the system. So what can individual citizens do to help foster depolarization in politics? And then alongside that, how can we better engage young people, students specifically, in civic participation? So how can individuals work on depolarization, but also increase their, their civic uh, participation? Um, I don't know, Governor, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, you know, I, I think elected officials in the main reflect the populations that elect them. And uh, so if we don't want corruption in, you know, we, uh, the people ought not to be corrupt. Uh, we come from the ranks. And so uh, if you want people with integrity and transparency, if you want people to vote their conscience, then they ought not to be pun punished for doing that. Uh, I know that I, I think in terms of Mitt Romney, again, it doesn't mean that, that, that I would necessarily do the same thing or vote the same way he does. But here's a man of integrity who voted his conscience, and yet he gets pilloried because he did it by Republican. And I think, gee, isn't that what we want people to do? To go back there, weigh and consider all the facts, and then vote your conscience, vote with integrity and transparency. Uh, so uh, we need to have the public itself be involved in making sure that that's the outcome. And stand up for those who do that as opposed to be join the crowd to cast stones at somebody because it seems to be the popular thing to do. It may not be the right thing to do, even if it's the popular thing to do. You know, uh, again, Congressman McAdams talks about our efforts on immigration and what we've done with refugees. They've been contrary to some of the popular opinion and uh, we've had a lot of support, but it was the hard thing to do and it was the correct and right thing to do. Uh, we have people uh, that, again, get engaged. And I, I, I hear the phrase, the silent majority, you know, and, we, and I believe that really is true. That's the truth. There's a silent majority out there. They need to become less silent because the Vulcan minority is out there on the front lines. And what they're saying is sometimes a little intimidating. I've had people in my front yard of my house here in the shadows of Utah Valley University there with automatic weapons carrying sidearms, uh, having to do with us trying to provide guidance and direction on protecting people's health uh, during the pandemic. And they're coming to my home, my neighbor's homes with sidearms. And you think, what are you, what's the point? What, what are you trying to do there? That doesn't solve a problem. This increased increase dialogue. So that's the minority, but a loud minority. The majority needs to stand up and say, we won't tolerate that kind of action. And for the people that they're supporting, we will, in fact, reject them. And last but not least, our young people. Uh, you know, I was in the Army uh, in the 70s, post kind of the end of Vietnam. But uh, as you recall from your history books, all you young people out there, uh, in 1971, because of the Vietnam War, it started actually during World War II, but with the Vietnam War, we had the, the cry that went out from the soldiers saying, if I'm old enough to fight and die for my country, I ought to be old enough to vote mm -hmm. and vote for those who send me into harm's way. And I support it when I was in the military, I support it today. Uh, unfortunately, even though it's changed to now age 18, the poorest demographic we have of those who do not participate is the 18 to 25 demographic. As I've gone around the state and meet with a lot of our young people, one of the things that I talk about is making sure you, you, and when you're 18, you register and you vote. Become an informed voter. There's no excuse not to do it. When I was in the military, 21 at the time, but I made the promise when I was 21 that I would always vote and I would never miss voting. I'm proud to tell you, President Tamias, I have never one time, I'll be 74 in May, not one time have I ever missed voting in a general or a primary election or a special election for that matter. I took it serious and when I was wearing the uniform, it made it a little bit more deeply personal to me. And so let's get our young people. There's no excuse to not be informed. We have ma uh, mail voting now, uh, uh, vote your, your ballot and mail it in. You have time to study the issues and the candidates so that you can become informed. It's not just going in on a Tuesday and flipping the coin deciding how to vote, you have time to study and understand and know 
of what the ideas are that you're going to support and vote for. So our young people, I give you the challenge, just like I did to myself, register and vote when you're 18 and promise the governor that you will never miss voting uh, the rest of your days. That's the commitment we need to have out of our young people. We need their voice and they can make a big difference in the outcome of elections. I thank you for that impassioned uh, plea. And uh, I promise you, Governor, uh, thank you for your good example too. I promise you that we will continue making those efforts, uh, especially here at the university. Um, just over a year ago, some students made an art project where they planted a flag for every student vote. And it's 40,000 little flags out on the lawn. And it was quite a powerful, a powerful visual. Um, so let me turn now to uh, Congressman McAdams. Well, I, I guess I'm gonna take two approaches. One, what we should do as people and in positions of influence to encourage participation and depolarization, and then maybe what uh, members of the community should do uh, to do that. So first, people in positions of influence. I think we need to uh, hold our elected officials accountable or all of us in positions of influence to, to be, per, to add to the legitimacy of our process, to act in a way that we are building up civic institutions and civic legitimacy. Because we tell people your vote matters. And then oftentimes people in positions of power act in a way that delegitimizes de that vote. So they're getting conflicting messages. Your vote matters, it doesn't matter. Uh, I wanna give a, a few quick examples. In my election, this is a story I actually haven't told publicly before, but in my election, there was a county clerk who sent out ballots uh, that were deficient um, and not in accordance with Utah state law. This is a county that I lost 80-20. So um, it was a, a very Republican county. They sent out ballots that were deficient. Then they sought to remedy that deficiency and they sent out ballots um, to correct that, that also was not, in our view, was not in accordance with state law. And we found out about all of this after the election. We looked at it and we said, there, we have a chance here to invalidate thousands of ballots because they did not comply technically with Utah law. And I thought about it and I asked my team, I said, do we think that voters, the votes were cast fraudulently? Well, no, we think that the voters, uh, voters voted thinking that their ballots were sufficient. And we think that these votes, like you lost, you lost this county 80-20. So, you know, we could seek to invalidate them on a technicality, but, you know, the voters, the voters point was clear. And I had a choice to um, try to win an election by invalidating votes on a technicality or saying, perhaps the, count, the county clerk made a judgment call. It may have been correct, it may have been incorrect, but um, there was no fraud. The voter's intent was clear. And I said, we need to respect the voter intent. We need to instill legitimacy in the election, even if that means I lose the election. Um, we need to respect what happens with the voters. And I think we need to expect our elected officials. It's hard to lose an election. I can tell you from firsthand experience. We need to expect our public officials to act in a way that recognizes that process and democracy is more important than any single person. Um, the second example I would give is Utah has adopted an independent commission for redistricting. I think what happens over the course of this year with that independent commission is gonna be telling. Are we going to, and this happens in Democratic and Republican states around the country that they draw the boundaries. If they're in control and they have power, they draw boundaries to favor themselves and to, you know, to stack the deck so that they're more likely to win an election. And, and then we tell people your vote matters, but we create the rules in a way that their vote doesn't really matter. Um, I am happy to see Governor Herbert, uh, or I'm sorry, Governor Cox, his appointee to this commission is somebody who in me inspired confidence. This is somebody who's gonna approach this, looking at his resume, um, is gonna approach this with independence and goals of the public in mind. And I hope that we respect that independent process and allow uh, the rules to be created fairly and not in a way that's gonna favor one side or the other. Um, I think there are other examples, but I think we want to expect our elected officials, Republican and Democrat to act in ways that instill trust and confidence in our systems rather than undermine our systems. And then lastly, speaking to the individuals, what we can do as just members of the community, um, Governor Herbert hit on one of these. And that, as I would say, allow your elected officials to have an opinion that's different than you. If they, if they cast a vote that you think is awful, um, but allow them the dignity of having a different opinion. And it's not because they are corrupt or because they um, don't care or they're hard-hearted or cold-hearted 
Um, maybe they really arrived at a conclusion that is different than the one that you arrived at for good and noble reasons. And let's allow them to have that dignity. And, you know, and then if you disagree, take it to the ballot box. Um, the second one I would say is allow our elected officials to also change their minds. Um, I'm sure Governor Herbert had this experience, but frequently people would come to me and say, in 2010, you voted this way. And now in 2019, you said this. And how do you reconcile that? Well, I've had nine years of experience and tell me anybody in any professional setting, I mean, I think you want your elected officials to learn and listen and to allow their attitudes and opinions to evolve over time. So allow your elected officials to have an opinion that's different than yours and that is still nobly and well intended and allow them to learn and to change their mind. These aren't signs that they're lying or being unauthentic. I, I think it's back to, you know, uh, uh, getting away from purity tests and litmus tests to a pragmatic approach, to an authentic, honest approach. Um, continuing with the role of individuals, there's a question here, here earlier that says, the early Republic had many civil institutions where the community worked face to face. Do we need a revival of these, quote, schools of democracy, unquote? And let me broaden this question a little bit. Governor Herbert said that, you know, the most indifferent or apathetic group is 18 to 25. And maybe at that point, somehow we haven't done our job. We were losing them. They're not owning democracy. They're not excited. They're not appreciating what this amazing system is that we have called American democracy. So 18 to 25 and even younger, you go to high school, middle school, elementary school. So the whole school of democracy, civics education, and I'm particularly interested because UVU is going to be uh, quite active in this in civics education. What are your best ideas on how we revive schools of democracy or revive civics education so that nobody takes for granted the system that we have, that we need to own it, practice it, keep it real and, and participate. Um, Congressman McAdams, do you wanna start on this one? Well, I think I'm, I'm so happy to be following what's happening at UVU with civic education. I think that is so important. And, and I think we've lost civic education. We've lost a lot of that skill set, that, that memory, muscle memory of how to approach critical thinking. Uh, you look at it in, in our media consumption. Our media, is, as Governor Herbert mentioned, you have media that reaffirms your existing biases, whether it's MSNBC on the left or Fox News or Newsmax and others on the far right, that simply they feel good because they tell you that what your, your view of the world is accurate. They don't challenge your view of the world. So you never feel that dysphoria, that discomfort of, of having your view challenged. I think we need institutions that challenge our worldview from the left and the right that help us to think critically and uh, allow more space for debate, uh, for disagreement without simply, you know, we hear something we disagree and, uh, and dislike, we just write it off, push it out of mind, um, it's a, a term that's overused, but cancel, we cancel something mm -hmm. that we don't like. And let's, let's start getting comfortable with discomfort again, and with dysphoria, and um, of thought. And, and we, I think we need to um, develop those, that muscle for critical thinking, and uh, analysis, and, um, and civic education. Thank you, Governor. Well, again, I think you're exactly right, President Taminas, in that we need to make sure that our young people are taught. Uh, they need to be educated. I think George Washington uh, said that we need to make sure that our educational system, that we have civic instruction so that our young people understand how important it is to uh, fight for democracy and appreciate their liberties and freedoms we have. I think we take it for granted too much today We've had it for a long time. We take liberty and freedom almost as a for granted thing each and every day. You don't because you came from a, a much more controlled atmosphere of uh, a government where government told you what and how and when. Um, we've worked hard in our administration. We've added to our K through 12 curriculum uh, information and studies on the constitution. So people understand what the constitution's says uh, uh, on our history of our state as well as history of our nation and its founding. Uh, we actually have an economics portion that talks about free market capitalism, which is kind of waning a little bit in popularity, particularly young people. And yet it's what's made America great. It's lifted more people out of poverty than any other kind of ism ever in the history of the world. So 
and yet capitalism is becoming kind of a dirty word. I think we don't quite understand how the free market works. So that's an education thing. I appreciate the first lady, Jeanette, who for her initiative was on parenting, the importance of parenting uh, and how you teach your children on a lot of different things, values, uh, the things that make you honest and, and have integrity, hard work ethic, you know, those kinds of things which uh, need to be taught and should be taught in home. That's the primary teaching environment. So if our children aren't learning, we need to look to our parents and say, why not? Last but not least, let me add a plug for the Herbert Institute of Public Policy. Again, with what you're doing here at UVU, the opportunity that I have to come here and help uh, give opportunities for our young people to learn about civic engagement, uh, have internships set up, whether it be at the state house, uh, with the legislature or the executive branch, et cetera, back in Washington, D.C. We're going to be partnering with other institutes around the state uh, to see if we can't combine our efforts and have a spirit of renewed cooperation, collaboration, kind of what we're talking about here today. Opportunities to have a lecture series where people can hear the pros and the cons of different issues and items and weigh in and learn and participate in that learning experience. Uh, again, the opportunities we have for people to, in fact, be prepared to be members of society, contributing members of society, not just in the job only side, but in civic involvement and civic preparedness is as an aspect of what we're going to be doing here at the Institute to, in fact, uh, provide this opportunity to make sure our kids understand what's made America great. Um, yes, I, I think so. Engagement is really important, uh, whether that's happening at UVU or in high schools or elementary schools. I was very impressed that my own 11 year old son just a week ago had an assignment in his class and he's only 11 years old. And it was, should the United States have dropped the two atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and that they weren't given an answer? They were asked to look at opposing sides. And we need to do that uh, on every aspect of our democracy and uh, the market economy to teach critical thinking. And Congressman McAdam said to be uncomfortable, to be comfortable in our discomfort. It's a phrase that I use a lot at UVU because I believe that the university is indeed a safe space for vehement disagreement. But at the end of the day, founded on common values, we can achieve uh, the, you know, a pragmatic middle where we enact public policies or university policies that strengthen and empower and help more people rather than not. Um, we have 17 minutes. I want to calibrate the timing here. Um, there is a question that I want to ask. It will put both of you on the spot. Um, can each of you respond to the situation in Georgia and Arizona regard, regarding proposed and newly passed voting laws? And I, I know this is controversial as to whether we are limiting the vote or not and what this implies for democracy. So um, uh, Congressman McAdams, could you start with that, please? For me, it's very sad to see, um, first of all, laws that are being passed in response to misinformation and, uh, and, and seems to be very clearly intended to disenfranchise or maybe not disenfranchise, but to make it more difficult for uh, African-Americans to vote in Georgia. Um, I, I think as Governor Herbert talked about, a, a good process leads to good solutions. Sometimes you win elections, sometimes you lose elections, but we should always err on the side of being more inclusive and bringing more people uh, to the table. And, uh, and, and the reforms that passed in Georgia are, are not about that. Now, certainly there's always needs to, to update vote, voter laws to ensure the integrity of elections and to ensure the greatest possible participation, um, but that is not what, what has happened in Georgia. And, um, and certainly, again, when you go back to if the, if the real goal is to have people believe in the legitimacy of the institution of the vote and the institution of democracy, those actions are delegitimizing act actions, not legitimizing actions. Governor? Well, I don't know all the details of the laws that have been passed. I know what the accusations are being made. And like Ben says, we ought to make sure that we have accurate information before we make decisions or enact policy. So if there's a problem that needed solving, I don't know what it was. But uh, I don't find offense if somebody says to me when I go to the, uh, to the elections office or when I cast a ballot and somebody says, before we accept your vote, uh, we need to see identification. We see that in grocery stores. We see that in all kinds of interactions we have to make sure that we have proper identification to prove that I am who I am 
and that the, I have the right to vote and, and that I'm not voting for somebody else. So I, I, I would like to make sure we, we have the information and see if we're, we're solving the problem. I agree that we should, in fact, encourage people to vote and participate. And just like we're, we should not be anti-immigration either. But there's a right way to have immigration. And we talk a lot about the fence and the wall. We should be talking a lot more about the gate, how people come and go. And uh, so we're missing kind of part of the picture uh, by a short-sighted look at immigration. Maybe that's part of what's probably happening with the vote being laws in Georgia and Arizona. I do know one that I heard, for example, you can't give anybody water, you know, while they're in line on a hot day. Well, that's not true. You can't do electioneering. <laughs> And so those who run the elections department, the clerks, uh, you know, which is what would happen here in Utah that run those uh, uh, voting booths and, and voting locations, if they feel like they, they need to provide nourishment out there for those who are waiting in line, they can do that. But you can't have the Republican Party go out there or somebody supporting a candidate and walk up and down the lines that you want to drink here. And that's called electioneering. And that is, in fact, illegal. And that's what they're talking about in Georgia. So I think there's misinformation there and people jump on. You won't even let them have water. No, that's not true. They can't have water. It's just who gives them the water is the issue. So that being said, you know, you'd think if, if we could just get people to sit down and have that kind of discussion. I, I, I know that at least the, uh, on this past election, uh, Brian Kemp, the governor of, of uh, Georgia and Doug Ducey, the governor of Arizona, my dear friend, both were attacked by their, their current sitting president for not doing the right thing. And yet they said both of them were just following the law and the constitution, which we swore to upheld, uphold. So they bucked, you know, their sitting president to make sure they did the right thing, which is the example that we all should follow. I, I think in this issue, there's also, uh, it's worth mentioning that there may be something again from the Utah way when mail-in ballots were being discredited that the state had long practice of that and, and facilitating the vote, which is um, a very special uh, right that, that citizens have that they can exercise. So in the remainder of time, there are a few questions here about polarization. I will just read them all at once and then we'll give you the last word. Can you speak specifically to the ways in which media ecosystems have contributed to polarization and divisions in our public square? The next question, how can we push for depolarization when the options are already so polarized? And then finally, where, where do you see American civic culture in 10 years? Are you optimistic or pessimistic? So I've just combined all of, the, of those questions about polarization. Is it as bad as we think it is? Do you feel optimistic or pessimistic? Uh, why or why not? And then let's see if we still have any, <clears throat> any time left after that. Um, may, maybe, uh, Governor, let's start with you. Okay, if I can remember them all. Uh, let me just say, I don't believe there's been a better time to be alive and be here in this great country or this great state than today. In spite of all the challenges we talk about, in spite of the pandemic, in spite of, uh, you know, economic downturns, the ups and downs, uh, you know, some of this lack of civility and respect, there's never been a better time to be alive and be in, in Utah and, and America than right now today. That's how optimistic I am about not only the past, but I think the best is yet to come. We're learning as we go. It's an evolutionary process. The fact we're having this conversation today, and most people agree, but probably what we're saying is a sign that the future is bright. We're going to make sure at UVU, and I, I know our other institutions are going to try to copy the same thing. We want to make sure that the rising generation, which are going to be the leaders tomorrow, are prepared to take on that responsibility. That comes with teaching, educating, understanding, dialogue, and having a good example set for them to follow. So I, I, I do feel like that the media, I mentioned a little earlier, cable television has been probably the most polarizing aspect, at least the, the news channels and the, the political channels on cable TV. Uh, and I, I don't know that they're always given a fair and balanced assessment of, of a situation. And that's unfortunate. I, we all have biases, but we have a lot of different TV stations out there that come with a bias. And if you're biased, you go there and you have your bias reinforced. 
that's not a healthy thing. I would rather have hear both sides of an issue. I enjoy hearing point and counterpoint. I think it helps me understand the, the different points of view and helps me solidify my own position where I think maybe the truth or the moderation would come together. We'd get some uh, practical outcomes. And so I like to hear the right and the left and have a healthy debate. Uh, I'll just mention the uh, same thing could be said about Ben McAdams. Uh, we have healthy debates and healthy discussions. Randy Horich, you have uh, uh, one of the top Democrats in Utah history. And Randy was the chairman of the Democrat Party. And, and he and I would have some really healthy, healthy debates. And what I appreciate about Randy and I appreciate about Ben, after that discussion, which could be kind of emotional, they were the first ones to say, hey, let's go get lunch. I'll buy. That's the kind of association, mutual respect, and ability to have, say, you know, I'm willing to hear different point of view and, and, and factor that into my information and see if it makes a change or a difference in what I think the policy should be. So uh, I think the media has played a good, uh, we're more informed. We have the ability to be more informed because of all the media outlets, but we ought to not just so, uh, focus on one aspect. We have people that go to the, the internet to find the answers to everything. And what I really like, as you mentioned Abraham Lincoln earlier, one of the great quotes, and you can go to uh, President Taminas to your internet web page, look up Abraham Lincoln famous quotes, and you're going to find this one. Abraham Lincoln said, don't believe everything you read on the internet. <laughs> he was so, totally prescient. Yeah, I know he was <laughs> a very visionary guy. And so we need to make sure that we gather information from many sources to sift through it, people that we trust and we think will give us a balanced, fair and balanced, pro and con uh, on any issue. Uh, we'd be much better off. But, but, but I think that quote is really from the book of Revelations, actually. Don't believe everything you hear on the internet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Could be there too. Maybe that's where Abraham Lincoln found it. He, he had on, the, on his table, he had the Constitution and the Bible were the two things he always had on his <laughs> on his table when he was president. So you could have got it from the Re book of Revelations. Okay, Congressman McAdams, and maybe you could uh, mention social media in, in, in your comments yeah. and, and whether I, you're optimistic or pessimistic. I certainly will. I, I think, um, you know, I, we got to be careful about lumping all of the media in because what you hear today is fake news and you can't trust the media. And I think we need to learn to recognize that we need to have a, a source where we can get common facts and the understanding of of what's happening in the world. I, I talk to friends who say, you know, I don't trust the media, so I, I do my own research. Oftentimes that means you're, you're resourcing from people from who held your same worldview and you're not really getting accurate information. So I would say, I do worry like Governor Herbert about cable news that is really just entertainment, infotainment, they call it, and then social media. Uh, I, I read a, a story the other day about Matt Gates, uh, who's, who's under fire right now for some decisions he's made and you know we'll let that play out how it will but uh that it was saying that he wake he would wake up in the morning thinking about what he could tweet or do or say that would get him on cable news that night and i compared that to my experience in congress where i would wake up in the morning and say i need to write a note to so and so because their sister died or and and i need to if i'm going to get this bill passed i need to build relationships on the other side of the aisle and i think about what i could do today to reach out and build relationships on the other side of the aisle so Cable news is part of the problem, but it is, it is creating a feedback loop where representatives are figuring out that they can act in a way that gets them on that cable news show, that helps them to raise money, that helps to raise their profile. So you're getting a, a self-reinforcing feedback loop that's troubling. And, uh, and the bridge building feedback loop that Governor Herbert is so good at, you usually get punished for that by reaching across the aisle. Um, not in Utah, maybe, but uh, by having those relationships on the other side of the aisle is something that you can get criticized for. So I would say I am, uh, after um, the insurrection and the divisiveness that we continue to see in Washington, divisiveness, I would say, on both sides uh, and an unwillingness from both sides to work with the other side, um, my, it, it saddens me for the future for our country. Um, I believe in America and I believe in the resiliency of American democracy. So I think we will come through this, but I am sad about the period we're in and um, sad about what the next few years probably hold for us. I would contrast that to say, I'm very optimistic about Utah and uh, the position we're in and that we have the right people at the table and the right approach to move forward and to prosper. 
President um, Venus, go, go ahead, Governor. I know we're about out of time, but I want to get in a plug uh, along the lines of what Ben has talked about. I, I guess one of the reasons I'm hopeful and optimistic uh, for, for a variety of reasons, but one of them is that we have people arising out of both parties saying, hey, we can do better. We can actually appeal to the better angels of our nature. We can work together knowing we're on the same team. And we happen to have an opportunity at Utah Valley on May the 5th to host Tim Shriver. That'll be here mm -hmm. as part of our Institute's efforts. And Tim Shriver, many people will not necessarily know. You might know Sergeant Shriver and the political involvement of the Kennedy family. But Tim Shriver's sisters, Maria Shriver, used to be married to Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, he's a Kennedy, looks like a Kennedy, talks like a Kennedy. Uh, he's a very bright man. And... Uh, He's got an organization called Unite. Uh, he's come and approached us. He says, I want to know more about what's happening in Utah because he's liked what he's seen. And I, and I, I appreciate the fact that, that we've been a good example to many. And we need to continue to be an example, not prideful about it, but humble uh, the fact that we can share information and what we've learned and hopefully make other states as, as good as Utah. But he's going to be here on May the 5th uh, talking to us about how can we come together? He's a good, solid Democrat and uh, a good Catholic boy. He'll tell you that and wants to come here and enlighten us a little bit on how we can come together between the two parties. That gives me hope. People like Tim Shriver out there and many others under different names saying, let's do better. Let's bring the country together and unite us in a common cause. I look forward to that, Governor. Thank you for um, informing our audience and friends today about that. So um, as moderator, it is my job to wrap up. And if I could emphasize maybe three points here at the end, uh, number one is optimism. I think I thank both uh, Congressman McAdams and Governor Herbert for ending on an optimistic note. The book that I mentioned earlier, Upswing by Robert Putnam and Shailen Romney Garrett also mentioned that one of the practical solutions is actually optimism, that at that individual level, we've got to keep believing. Uh, number two, I want to say that what I learned from this conversation today is, um, you know, that the American experiment still remains uh, vibrant, but it is work in progress. And as such, it has its very real challenges. And so I, I urge us to stay um, comfortable in discomfort, to look for our common ground, and then to try to make that happen because we, we can be involved in so much that is good. And then finally, as we talked about, younger people or voters in general, that it is important that we own this opportunity of continuing to build a, a democracy. Um, individuals have responsibilities, politicians and leaders have responsibilities as well, and institutions like the government, like Utah Valley University, we have responsibilities mm -hmm. to um, create and sustain those bonds of affection and the pragmatic ways in which that affection manifests. So everybody, please join me in thanking uh, Governor Gary Herbert and Congressman Ben McAdams, and also the Center for the Study of Ethics here at Utah Valley University. Um, I love having conversations like this. I think it makes us uh, smarter and better citizens and allows us to ask you know, what we can do to better serve one another, which is, I think, a, a great way to, to live life. So I, I will clap for the governor and Congressman McAdams and others who want to we'll clap that. for you. Please feel free to do so. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to ask the speakers to hang on for another minute. And thank you to everybody who participated today. We are grateful that you came and joined us. Thank you. Stay on, Governor.